Hey there, welcome to the Drawing Codex. How do you color your scanned pencil drawings in Photoshop like a professional? How can you get a really, really high-end result using this very simple tried and tested process? What I wanna do in this video is answer that question and do a real-time, fully narrated, start-to-finish tutorial on how to color your line drawings in Photoshop. This is actually part two of a series and in the first part, the link for this will be in the description. I actually drew this drawing from start to finish as well. So you can check that out if you want to follow along with the first part where we do the drawing. What we're gonna do here is actually dive into a number of things. We're gonna talk about the scanning process, how you can optimize the actual drawings that you do to give you a really good result that you can tweak easily in Photoshop. And I'll talk about the process that I actually use in Photoshop and show you from start to finish how I do that. I also wanna talk about some of the great art that has been created using this process in the past. I used this same technique to create the first book that I ever had published as a professional artist. And I also used it more recently on a card game where I had to draw an entire card game with 70 plus finished illustrations using scanned pencil drawings because it worked really well. But we'll also look at, again, some other really great examples of this type of art. This Breath of Fire art book, I think is one of my sort of favorite art books and has a lot of art created with just really simple pencil drawings and color. In fact, a lot of concept art is really just created with simple line and color drawings and frequently people are still doing that professionally, um, you know, starting with pencil drawings. Some other great examples you can have is the amazing James Jean, who, you know, created a lot of his illustrations using sort of scanned pencil drawing. Now, this will be a laid back, real time, fully narrated tutorial. So sit back and relax. We'll jump in and get started. All right, welcome again to the Drawing Codex. My name's Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this channel, we're all about drawing cool stuff from our imagination, embracing the challenge of drawing and mastering the craft of line and color illustration. Now, if you want to check out more or learn more about line and color illustration, you can check out my free quick start guide. It goes over my basic tips for getting up and running, drawing both the lines and the color digitally in Photoshop. And a lot of those things that I go over in that quick start guide will also be really useful in this tutorial where we're going to scan the lines but still use a very similar process in Photoshop. You'll also be able to get all of the brushes and the PSDs and a lot of the other stuff that I use that you might see me sort of playing with in this tutorial. So go check that out. It's free. The link will be in the description. Okay, so this is a pretty simple process overall. What we're gonna do is do a pencil drawing. We've already done that. We're gonna scan it, take it into Photoshop, essentially put that scan on a layer, set it to multiply and put colors underneath. And then we're gonna do a few other things in terms of adjusting the color of the lines and maybe doing some sort of work over the top to tweak it a little bit, doing some color adjustment, talking about how to add atmosphere, how to modify the overall color scheme and sort of adjust the composition on the fly. Even after we're kind of pretty much done, there's a lot that can be sort of changed with this style. Now, the process that I use is actually pretty basic, but I do want to go over it and cover a number of things. The first is how do I'm actually scanning this? The second is what can you do to sort of help or improve the actual sort of drawing that you do to make sure that the sort of process works as well as it can um, when you do bring it into Photoshop and adjust those lines. And the other thing I wanna talk about is again, just share with you some of the other art that I think is really cool that uses this same process and give you some insight into how I developed a lot of the processes that I have used extensively as a professional artist. I really do think that this technique has something special to it. And even after, again, decades and decades of being a digital artist and drawing other books 100% digitally, I still come back to my love for pencil drawing and just the look that it gives. 
It's very frustrating to spend so much time and money on digital tools and then go back to having a very, very cheap scanner and, you know, basic sort of pencil and paper and just being able to get a much, much better result overall. Now, the digital process has a lot of benefits. And if you are working professionally, I think that's really why I tend to work digitally because it's a lot easier to make changes. It's a lot easier to modify things and sort of help clients see what's going on. But for projects and art where this is a little bit more personal and what you're primarily focused on is just sort of creating an amazing image, there's no reason you can't use this process. Um, it is the digital stuff really, really helps when you might have to make a whole bunch of changes, tweak things, redraw the lines a whole bunch of times. That can be a little bit of a pain, um, you know, if, if you're making late changes to a pencil drawing after it's been scanned in. That can be challenging. Um, and that's where, again, digital tools are so good from an artist's point of view. But as I said, there's something really special about this that I think is maybe never going to be beat by digital tools. Okay, so how am I scanning this? Well, what I have is just a fairly sort of cheap scanner and probably what I'd say is you can get, you know, whatever scanner you can get will probably work fine. This is not um, a huge drawing. And if you have a really, really, really large drawing, you probably will need a bigger scanner than this. But there's a couple of tricks that you can really use. And this is one of those reasons why I still personally use Photoshop. There's a number of tricks, both in the scanning and the adjustment of the lines, and also the way we can use selections within Photoshop to help us speed up the process that make Photoshop a lot more um, sort of functional than sort of other digital art programs that I've seen. Now, the way that I do this is, again, I just have a simple sort of flatbed scanner. The ones that I use are these sort of Canon LIDE scanners. Again, um, I think this is a LIDE 220, which again is just because I sort of bought one probably seven or eight years ago or something like that. And the reason I use these is because the you can sort of fold this um, sort of flat pretty easily. It will sort of allow you to fit um, a fairly sort of chunky sketchbook or something in there. It also just runs off USB power. So you don't need to sort of plug it into power and then plug it into your computer as well. It's just kind of like one cable. Typically what I do with this is I kind of put it somewhere and um, you know I do want to often be able to sort of shove it out of the way or drag it out somewhere so that I can potentially, you know, from a functional standpoint, be able to kind of put a big bit of paper on it or something like that. So I found that just sort of cheap, simple scanners are pretty good if you're not sort of scanning color. If, you, if you're scanning color and you need sort of high-end sort of professional results, you're probably going to need a really expensive scanner. If we're just scanning line art though, you can get away with pretty much anything available. Again, this is not a professional scanner by any means and um, I, I don't have a big sort of A3 scanner that is of this quality. And I found this is sort of pretty, pretty sort of easy. Now, the process that I use for scanning, again, apologies, I'm sort of juggling a whole bunch of stuff around, but there's no other way to kind of really show how this works, is often I will have a bit of paper that is bigger than the scanner, and that's often what you sort of want. You want a giant bit of paper so you can draw a nice sort of big drawing on it. Now, what we'll do is we can actually stitch these together very easily in Photoshop. So what I'm going to do is take one scan like that. I'm then going to move it across, make another scan like that, and then move it across and do another scan like that. What you find is you can scan pretty big drawings this way. Even if you have a sort of, you know, drawing that, that's almost sort of, you know, sort of double or and double this way and double that way, you can sort of just scan little bits of it at a time. And uh, again, th there's some limitations there, but you know, if, if the scanner's this big, you can probably you know, scan a drawing that's somewhere around that big, right? And I found that works quite well. Again, Photoshop is, has really, really good stitching ability and it just all happens automatically. I'll show you this in a minute. So that's what I'm actually using, fairly cheap scanner. Um, I find that just being able to sort of throw it around and if I drop it or if it breaks or something like that, it's not the end of the world. Um, even though I've been doing this professionally for a long time, I've never bothered sort of dropping 10 grand on, 
you know, a giant sort of professional A3 scanner. Um, I've gotten by with this most of the time. If you've got any questions about any of the technical aspects here, just leave a comment below and I'll see if I can sort of help you out. Let's jump over to the drawing table though. And what I'll do is share with you some tips on how to sort of think about creating art with a pencil so that we optimize this process and basically give us the best result once it's actually scanned. All right, here we are at the drawing table. Now this is the same drawing that we completed in the first part of this tutorial. And if you didn't check that out, you can go see the link in the description and see how this was created. But before we sort of move on, again, I wanna talk about a few things that you can do and how to think about this art um, as it's on the page. What do you need to worry about? What do you need to not worry about? At its core, the most important thing is that you have a really, really good contrast range between the sort of darkest darks that are your final lines that you really, really want to come forward and the paper. Now, it's possible to kind of erase all these little marks. You can see there's a few little things here. We can erase those. I can erase a lot of the little construction lines in here if I want. Now, if this is a sketch, which this kind of is, and I'm not sort of doing this as a book cover or some kind of highly polished image. Again, in that previous um, sort of video, I talked a lot about this image, which is actually a sort of um, a cover. It's the cover for that sort of Mythic Arcana game that I talked about. And again, we went over that in the first part of this tutorial. Now, in this case, what you can see is that the actual finished lines here are much less dark than the drawing here. It's not the darkness of the lines that is so important. What's important is that you are drawing on a paper that is sort of approximating a bright white. You don't want to be sort of messing around with a really sort of heavily toned paper. If you can get something that's kind of bright white, then that's a really, really nice place to start. Again, you find, you know, just sort of copy paper is a really good sort of, you know, bright white in most cases. Uh, often, you know, some watercolor papers or high-end papers will, you know, not really be designed for scanning in this way. And this, this watercolor paper is, you know, specifically um, sort of chosen because, again, it was the brightest white sort of version. Now, again, the thing you're looking for is just to make sure that the final lines that you've got are of sufficient contrast versus the paper. That really is all that matters. We can sort of crunch a lot of these sketchy lines out. That's not really going to make a huge difference. It can also pay to really make sure that you sort of accentuate some of these darker areas here and sort of push them back a little bit. But at its core, all you really have to worry about is just making sure that the contrast between your darkest lines and the paper is sufficient so that you're not going to be left with a lot of sort of paper texture as we sort of crunch this up in Photoshop. The other thing you want to try and avoid is large areas of smudging. So, you know, if you're accidentally kind of smudging a whole bunch of stuff, it can be really useful to, you know, go back and sort of erase some of that out right and just kind of make sure that that doesn't show up as much um, again it's your choice how much of this sort of sketchy stuff you leave as I was saying in that previous video it's often easier to actually clean these things up in Photoshop especially if your paper is not of a high enough quality that you can sort of hack it away and you don't mind sort of maybe sort of redrawing some stuff so that really is the most important thing just make sure you have a sufficient contrast ratio and you know that the main lines that you want to be there are significantly darker than any of the other lines it really is just a hierarchy as long as they're darker than the sort of sketchy lines that are left over then we can sort of bring those lines that we want up and push down the rest now as i said it's really worth looking at a lot of cases where people are using this type of simple line and color art for professional work and in many cases as well i think people are frequently just using pencil sketch scanned into photoshop 
and that that's then used to uh, as a base to kind of create flat colors and then push it and create a finished illustration. It obviously has a particular look. It's going to be good for some things, maybe not so good for other things, but it's my opinion that this technique will basically always serve you really well to create finished, polished, professional illustrations. And again, I think there's lots and lots of examples of that. Now, you can choose to sort of ink the drawings um, as sort of a finished sort of way of, of creating the final lines. Or as I'm doing, you can just sort of create those finished lines as a darker version of the line and then tweak it in Photoshop. This is one of my favorite art books, the Breath of Fire 4 um, art book. And in this art, yeah, it was just all about pencil drawings, essentially. And I loved the sense that you could create these worlds that way. This is obviously a lot of the concept art for that game. But I really feel like it, there were also lots of great examples where this was used to create a, a lot more sort of rendered you know, well-polished um, art. And again, the sort of um, artist who created a lot of this work is, you know, well-renowned within, you know, the other Capcom games. And you can see them using a very, very similar process. It's very effective. And the concept of line and color artwork being used on production environments is, you know, well, it's a well-trodden path. There's many, many reasons why it still works very, very effectively. So, Hopefully this gives you a bit of inspiration for, you know, what you can do with this type of style. You can create a lot of concept art and you can operate very, very effectively in the concept art world just with sort of line and color illustrations. I still find that this is just a really good way to create strong designs and also to, you know, be able to create very clear designs as opposed to painting. If you just kind of draw it and really delineate a lot of these things, it can actually be a very, very functional way to create model sheets and drawings that are clear so that you can work in that type of production environment. And again, it's also the case that often I would see, you know, artists use this same sort of technique for, you know, really, really high quality professional illustrations as well, you know, sort of finished book cover style illustrations. One of my favorite artists has always been the amazing James Jean. This is all of his uh, fables, uh, comic book covers. And again, you can see this kind of process. Th these books are really good from a process standpoint. And I, and I feel like his, um, he's always been really, really generous sharing his process and how he created a lot of these things. Some of them obviously are done with much more sort of paint and sort of polish and finish that's then scanned and tweaked in Photoshop, which is pretty much the, the same kind of process. It's just that the black and white sort of drawing is done a little bit differently. But there were always cases, again, where you could see that essentially it was a uh, pencil drawing that's kind of, you know, scanned and then sort of modified and tweaked in Photoshop. And there's many, many, many other amazing examples of exactly this thing. I think it's uh, still an effective way to create art and you can, you know, choose to do this traditionally or digitally. It doesn't really matter. But as I said, there's something always fun about drawing with pencil on paper. All right, let's jump over to Photoshop and get started. All right, so here we are with our view of Photoshop. Now, as you can see, if I sort of, uh, you know, if we sort of turn the camera, you can see essentially this is the pencil drawing and it looks very similar, but I actually started, um, you know, scanning this in three different sort of separate scans. So we can see that here in a second, I've got three different versions. And all I've done here is just basically move that sort of you know drawing on the scanner and sort of scan a whole bunch you could scan them in any way shape or form it doesn't make any difference i have actually when i'm traveling used my travel camera to take a whole bunch of different um, sort of pictures of some sort of sketchbook pages because i didn't have a scanner and then what you do is you stitch them together. So let's look at how we do that. All right, so I've closed the already completed one so that it's easier for me to show you how this is done. Um, the easiest way for you to do this is to just open up the files that you do want to merge and sort of close everything else. And I'll show you why in a second. 
Now how we do this is go file in Photoshop, automate, and we do photo merge. And this sort of system has been in Photoshop for quite a while. And it's one of the reasons I still think Photoshop has an edge on a lot of other sort of, you know, art focused digital art programs because there is a lot of really high end photographic levels, um, stitching. Again, these are mainly used for panoramas, but it Photoshop does a really, really good job of this. And these tools have improved immensely over time. Same with the selection tools in Photoshop. They really are next level and, you know, absolute sort of pinnacle industry standard in terms of being able to select, modify colors and do this kind of stuff, which again, a lot of other programs really, really struggle with. So all you do is just go photo merge and then we're going to use files. Um, I'm just going to add open files and then it just adds these TIFFs, which were just sort of whatever my scanner um, spat out. I haven't gone over the specific scanning process because again, that'll depend on your scanner. What I would say though, in terms of scanning is that you don't want to sort of have any of the automatic contrast or sharpening or anything that your scanner is going to do because Photoshop is going to do a much better job of that, as I said. So just get the most kind of normal, unaffected image out of your scanner, scan as many sort of drawings as you think you need. Then we just add them as open files and that's all we need to do. Now I'm just going to click OK and I'm just going to use the sort of automatic one and it's just going to sort of chug on this for a second, copy them all into a file and then kind of do the masking automatically based on the sort of, you know, script that it has to do this, which again, you know, as you can see there is pretty good. It's a pretty good version of that. Now you can see what it's doing is essentially just taking these layers and stitching them together. And it's just, you know, basically just got a really, really good algorithm for doing that. But uh, yeah, you know, I can't, I can't really see where it's, um, you know, where it's sort of doing that, right? It's that that's where the, the mask is and it's basically pixel perfect, right? You, you can't really see where it's making those adjustments. Now, this is really, really important because doing this kind of thing, stitching these things together traditionally has been a huge, huge pain and takes a while. And anytime we can sort of shave a little bit of time off the process, that's where we sort of save ourselves pain and probably make money at the same time. All right, so let's close all of this down and we'll get back to the sort of original one that I have, which is saved and all sort of organized well. Now, I've scanned this at 600 DPI because that is going to give us a nice large canvas to work with. You can see here that it's pretty, if we go to pixels, it's pretty big. It's sort of 9,000 pixels by 7,000 pixels. You might want to res that down if you're doing this in Photoshop. And that's just a matter of, again, sort of adjusting that sort of pixel density. Um, just sort of pick something that's smaller than that so that, um, you know, it's not going to uh, destroy your computer. Again, this one will sort of handle a fair bit of that. So I'm just going to merge those down, control E, and then, um, you know, all those layers are now one. And I basically just got this drawing as uh, a simple layer. So what I'm going to do is create another layer to go under it. So you can again, go here, make a new layer. I've got key keyboard shortcuts for all of these things. And the next thing we're going to do is just set this to multiply. Now I'm going to leave a lot of the, normally what I do is crop it at this point and start to sort of jump in and try and figure out what the image is like. But I'm going to talk about how we process the lines using the adjustment layers and mostly sort of levels before I do that. Now, if you have checked out the quick start guide, um, then uh, you sort of see there are some processes I use there. And this again is another reason why I do sort of like Photoshop for this type of work because there's a lot of automation that you can do if you sort of start using these things for professional um, purposes. And, um, you know, that can really, really help. So what I would do at this point is run an action. So there you go. You can see that this action has automatically done a lot of that tweaking for me. Now let's step back through this process though, and look at what's actually happening. So if we, 
if we sort of take that layer out of there and see if we can do that on our own and I'll sort of talk about what's happening in terms of adjusting those layers. So the way that I like to do this is through adjustments as opposed to sort of actually adding levels to this image. What I'm going to do is create a series of adjustment layers. So we do that by going down here to this little icon on the bottom of the screen and we can select a levels adjustment layer. What we're going to do now is sort of be able to tweak and adjust the darkness of the lines. Now you can see that there's a good opportunity here to play around with this and sort of get whatever look you want. And the reason I've left a lot of this extra scan stuff here is so you can sort of see how the levels are adjusting and tweaking what you can see on the page. Um, it's very easy to sort of notice where there are, you know, sort of textural sort of things all over the page, little bits and pieces. A lot of these might actually be sort of artifacts from the scanner. The advantage with an adjustment layer is that you can sort of go and tweak it, play around with it, and none of it is final. So what I'm essentially doing in most cases is, yeah, just kind of tweaking this, seeing whether I can get these lines to look right. Now, if you blow it out, you can see that it's very easy to go a little bit too far and, you know, maybe sort of end up with something where the lights are a little bit sort of blown out. So here you can see if I sort of push that, I'm starting to lose some of the information there. And that's not what we want. What you want to do is sort of adjust the levels just so that you pull this right slider in until we're starting to sort of get rid of most of the obvious paper texture. And then you can sort of essentially just a lot of this will depend on what look you want. And I just sort of recommend that you experiment and play around. We're going to want to do a mix of sort of bringing the midtones, i.e. this middle slider up a little bit. And also sort of really crunching and bringing in this slider here, which is going to sort of push the dark. So it's going to be a mix of those things. But as I said, we don't actually often need to go that far because we can do a range of other little bits and pieces. And I'll sort of talk about how you can layer these things on top of each other and get some really, really interesting results. And we can also make sure that we adjust the contrast overall at the end of the process. So we don't always have to do it here. Um, it, it's sort of fine. And the other thing that's really important to understand is I'm going to put these in a group and this is going to be editable all the way to the finish. So we don't even need to worry about getting this right at the beginning, which I think is really, really important. If you want to just jump in, play around with this, I think it's really, really vital that you keep a lot of these things editable so that you can adjust and get a feel for once you've actually put in colors, how the lines and the darkness of the lines and the color of the lines is going to affect that. So here's what we're going to do to make that possible. I'm going to create a new layer and fill it with white here. So we create new layer and I'm going to go edit, fill, and we're going to fill it with the foreground color. Um, which is black in this case, but uh, again, I'm going to press X to get white. We'll try that again. Edit, uh, fill, uh, foreground color. Now we've got white. So what I'm aiming for is a stack of layers. I've got the line layer here. I've got a white layer underneath that, and I've got the levels on top of that. I'm going to select them all by pressing shift, right, and selecting them all there or you can hold alt and shift and you can hold alt and click on them all separately and then i'm going to press Control g or the mac equivalent and that's going to give me my group here now what i'm going to do is set that whole group to multiply as opposed to just the lines themselves this will become it'll become evident why this is sort of so powerful and important as we progress now let's look and test the sort of general idea of what we've got here before we proceed. So I'm going to fill the, let's get a different brush. Yeah, I'm going to fill the sort of background layer there, the, the bottom layer. And 
we can sort of paint on this. Again, I've just got the most basic sort of pencil round brush here. But you can see that now what I have is a group which contains the lines, right? If I sort of move them around, we can see that we can move and adjust that sort of group quite effectively. And then I'm going to be able to sort of color under it. Now, I go over this again in the quick start guide. So if you want a little bit more information on this, then, um, you know, sort of check that out. And I cover this sort of concept in depth. Um, if you really want the sort of the in-depth version, again, I, color all, I, I cover all of these techniques in my Line and Color Academy course, which, uh, you know, goes over every single sort of thing you could possibly think to do with sort of scan drawings and, and Photoshop um, sort of lines as well. But this really is all we need. We've got the basics here, and what we need to do is basically just put color underneath this. Before we start to think too much more about the color, a really good thing to do is crop this, right? So I'm going to press C for the crop tool, and I'm going to hold Shift, which is sort of going to give me a square. And I'm going to draw a square, and then that's going to give me yeah, some sort of indication of how maybe this could look. Now, what I talked about in the first part of this series where we drew this is that this is more of a spontaneous image. And what we need to think about is how we can consider composition at this stage. Doing it with this crop tool is actually a really good way to spot your sort of rule of thirds as a compositional tool. What I can potentially do is you know, maybe move this around. Think about, you know, where those sort of rule of thirds are going to lie. And, you know, you could sort of line some stuff up with the sort of rule of thirds points. I'm not actually going to worry about that too much. I think this is an interesting sort of composition. And it follows a lot of basic rules, which is let's just put the main character in the center. We've got some nice motion through the page. I don't think the rule of third is really going to help us much in that case. So there, we've sort of cropped that. Now, I have sort of set on here, delete cropped pixels, but you don't necessarily have to delete cropped pixels. You could sort of leave that on so that, um, again, those sort of pencil, those pencil lines are still there outside the frame. So before we start to think about the color, I'm going to do two things. The first is I'm going to clean up this drawing a little bit. And the second is I'm actually going to use Photoshop selection tools to help me get the main outline of this character. And in order to do that, we'll use a few layer tricks. The first thing though is to get rid of this scanned feeling of there being this sort of paper there. So there's many, many different ways you could do this. If I just go along and oh, let's, let's use a soft eraser. All right, I can just delete that like that. That's pretty simple. And the thing there is that, again, we've got this sort of deleted, transparent lack of anything on this um, lines layer. Now that's fine because I've got this white layer underneath and that means that this all will work. So again, you can check out the quick start guide, but just trust me, if we put a white line, a white layer underneath our lines, it helps a lot of these things and it, it avoids, um, yeah, just situations where the multiply and a lot of these other concepts are not gonna work quite as well, especially once we start adding color to the lines. Other things that you could do to potentially tweak these um, sort of lines is, you know, we could do something like, let's make a new layer. So create a new layer there. Again, I've got a keyboard shortcut for it. I'm gonna hit B for brush, um, get to my pencil tool, and then I'm gonna select an airbrush. Again, I'm doing all of these by keyboard shortcuts. And let's select white, hit D for default, X for swapping the colors. And yeah, I'm just gonna paint on top of this layer stack with white, and that will work as well. And all this does is basically just sort of erase out, erase out those lines. So I'm just literally painting with an airbrush. I'm painting out sort of any of these little bits and pieces that might cause us trouble. 
Now, again, as I said, what you can do is actually go in there and paint with whatever brush or adjustment or dodge and burn actually does a really good job of this as well. But I found just painting some white on top of everything is a really, really easy, oh, or easy, effective solution as well. All right, so you can go through and you can tweak. As I said, we can clean up these lines. We can get rid of some of this stuff if we want, or you can just leave it on, which is normally what I do, because uh, often it sort of looks, it doesn't look too bad, right? It, it adds energy to the sketch and it works pretty well. But again, if you want, you can go through and clean as much of this up as you want. And you can go all the way, right? You could fully sort of clean this up and, and get very, very clean there. As I said also, you know, we've got a lot of draw through here. I can get rid of that. Um, I can sort of either tone down or get rid of these lines over here. And I can also, you know, make my life a little bit easier in terms of finding a outline or um, silhouette for this by just deleting, yeah, anything that was kind of a, a sketch line or something that is not going to be the, the final. If you get really sort of fancy with it, you can also, you know, do a little bit of extra drawing here. You know, you, you could kind of really touch something up if something really needs to be changed. It is possible to, you know, go quite far here, as I said. All of those things will take a lot of experience, though, to get it right, figure out how far you can go, you know, what's possible, what's not possible. Again, you can see there's a lot of these sort of construction marks for this axe here that I've still got. Now, do I need to get rid of all of them? Again, depends how polished the illustration needs to be. I'm just getting rid of, you know, the, the bulk of them, just sort of toning them down. I'm pretty confident that once I get rid of a lot of the, you know, once I put color under it, a lot of these things aren't going to be as strong. So again, the thing here to pay attention to is I am doing this as a layer, right? So I can turn that off and then it's still there. So most of the things that I do are aimed at sort of a non-linear process, which again, I found really, really helps from a professional standpoint to make sure that if you need to make changes, if you need to edit things, you've always got them there. So I'm not really changing the original lines. The original lines are there. And my goal is, again, despite that big deletion I did in the, in the beginning, my goal is never to mess with these lines that exist because I might need to reconsider. I might need to tweak those later on, adjust the contrast, whatever. There's a huge variety of what ifs and I never want to be stuck with, you know, being trapped um, in, in that silly position where I, I sort of did have the right answer. I did have the ability to make that adjustment and now I've kind of deleted it. Uh, again, that's just me, but it is one of the reasons why I find using Photoshop, lots of layers and all of those things that come with Photoshop and Photoshop does well, as opposed to, you know, like a program like Procreate or, you know, something else that sort of is, is, is more based on a traditional sort of building the, the drawing up process. I find that this uh, really helps just from a speed and professional, you know, ability to kind of make changes basically when, when other people are wanting me to make changes. Especially when we can't just go in and redo the lines because they're digital lines. It's very hard to kind of actually, you know, just go in there and, and redraw that stuff. This way, if we just kind of massage them and have the ability to go back, it means we're still getting some of that digital undoability, right? <laughs> Terrible word, but we're still getting some of that ability to kind of modify, go back, um, reconsider still keep things editable, still keep our options open. Even if, uh, again, the one thing we probably can't do is just, you know, redraw the lines in any major way, but we can tweak them. We can figure out, you know, how much of the sketchy stuff works. The other thing I'd say that's really, really critical is that when you're starting out your journey with this type of art, it's very good to be able to test your style and say, how much 
cartoony sort of sketchiness do you want to be in the drawing you might find that you know originally we sort of clean this all up and then at the very end what we can do is sort of take that away and say hey does it actually make it better or worse let's find out as i mentioned you can play around with this forever and and you can really clean this up or you can just kind of leave it how it is it doesn't really matter here's the next trick that i would use to really speed up the process and that's where what i want to do is be able to select the outline of this character and have a really sort of clean version of that. If you select the magic wand tool, and we'll do a couple of things. I'm gonna turn anti-aliasing off, because that is often uh, one of these things that will help us to get a really clean selection. We're just gonna be selecting with blocky um, sort of pencil tool slash non-allied um, um, art. Uh, again, check out the quick start guide if you want a little bit more information on this. And I'm gonna turn this tolerance down to about sort of 10 or something like that. What this gives us is, and I'm also going to sample all layers. The other thing I'm gonna do is let's take this back to white. That gives us a good contrast range. So again, I just created a white layer. And that means that when I select here, what I'm getting is a pretty good selection here of all this space around the character. And I can actually use that to get me a very, very nice selection so that I don't have to go and do all of that sort of flatting of the sort of character to begin with. Now, if you've looked at other tutorials and if you look at the quick start guide, what I often see is the quickest, easiest way is just to kind of block in a flat version of the character underneath these lines so that we can separate the character from the background early on. And if you just do that by hand, you can kind of use that process in any program and uh, it's very effective and it's the easiest way to start. What I'm gonna share with you here is a sort of slightly more sort of advanced, quicker way of doing things. So if we go into quick mask and hit Q, you can see that this is sort of what I've selected. Now this is a little bit of a mess. You can see it's picking up a huge array and a huge amount of this texture. Now I guess you have a couple of options. One is I can go into the pencil tool, right? So I'm hitting Shift B until I get the pencil tool here, which again gives me that, right? That sort of bitmap, non-allized, right? Or you know, it is it is allized, right? It's it's got this kind of um, sort of yeah allized edge, right? Ch sort of chunky right that's not soft if you if you use a brush version of you know sort of some brush you you see that the edge is soft what i want is not that because it's going to make it a lot easier to do some selections later on so we can see that in this case there's problems right there's problems with this so what I could do, as I said, is just get this tool and I'm just going to sort of paint on this quick mask and I'm just going to tweak it. And what I'm going to do is create a mask that is a refinement of this initial selection. And you can go in there and again, sort of use this and tweak it and get rid of all of these. So all I'm doing is just painting with black and white on a mask. This is not a super basic sort of intro to Photoshop tutorial so well worth sort of checking out how quick mask works how all those things function again i have all of those i have a lot of those sort of basic ideas in the quick start guide and um all of that stuff is is in the the, the course um, that i have but again i'm not expecting anyone to to need to check that out what we can do though is use the levels to tweak that and, and get further along so Let's go out of quick mask and you can see again, here's the marching ant sort of selection version of this. I'm gonna hit control D to deselect. And what I wanna do is basically blast out with levels all of this kind of junk and see if I can get a better selection. Remember, all I need is just this outline. What you could do, as I said, is just kind of do this by hand. And this actually wouldn't be you know, this wouldn't take too long with a simple sort of drawing like this, but I could just, you know, create a, a simple set of flats like this for the character. And let's turn anti-aliasing off there. Let's set the paint bucket to 10 as well. And here. So again, I'm just 
gonna basically go around, do the same thing, paint in those flats. That is one option. What we can do is again a little way, a little bit in the middle. I'm gonna create a new layer within my group of lines there, and I'm gonna hit levels. And what I'm gonna do is just blast out all of the white. So this is gonna get us a pretty ugly drawing, but that's fine because that's all I need. But what I do wanna do is make sure it does close, right? Make sure it's, um, you know, it, it is kind of closing here. Otherwise those selections won't work that well. So again, what I'm doing is crunching, crunching that up. Let's see if we can separate these guys out a little bit. get to kind of there yeah so again the exactly where you need to put all of these sliders and things is going to change depending on yeah exactly which um, you know what your scan drawing looks like basically so that there's no perfect sort of adjustment that works you, you do have to kind of look at it and try and sort of crunch that down now it's getting rid of some of it um, I think we could probably get rid of, you know, a little bit more. We can tweak this again. Sort of push that. Again, that's looking pretty good. Now we are going to pick up still a few little bits and pieces, but I think this will do a much better job. Let's give it a try. Select um, the wand tool with W and let's select... Oh sample all layers and again here we go so you can see what it's done is I'm getting much less of that sort of paper texture but what we need to do now is sort of close off some of these lines so I'm doing a bit of a mix of still going in there and doing some of this by hand and a lot of these things you you have to sort of tweak them to fit your exact sort of process. Some of these things might, you might need to really sort of crunch it depending on your paper color, exactly what's going on with your style, etc., etc. This does require a lot of sort of experimentation. It's not a matter of just watching a tutorial and sort of feeling like, okay, that's it, done. This is gonna give me all the answers. This is talking about how you kind of can modify these variables, but it's gonna be up to you to figure out exactly how these things work, to learn the tool of Photoshop, and to make sure that you're able to get the most out of it. So here I'm gonna progressively sort of fill these in, selecting the paint bucket tool, and just kind of clicking here, seeing where things are closed, seeing where things are open, and just kind of filling this in. I'm gonna fill in this and, and here I'm kind of just painting right some of this stuff in Oop, so you can see there there's still some sort of open open loop of lines somewhere maybe somewhere in there yeah there we go and you can see there's little bits that I've missed here and there it's well worth sort of zooming up really going in and mostly what I'm doing so this is a mask which works on a grayscale black and white um, sort of image basically so I'm just painting on it with a very very basic uh, brush the pencil brush and I'm just switching between black and white right uh, using the X key and that allows me to again paint in some mask paint out some mask all right I'm gonna hit X and you can see the the colors there are switching boom 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 etc etc um, and yeah, that's the, that's the basic process that, that I'm going to, I'm going to be using for this. Now, normally I would sort of blast through this process really quickly. I'm, I'm taking a long time sort of explaining the, the thoughts that are going on, um, a few of the technical bits and pieces. Again, this is probably getting to this point is, you know, a sub five minute affair if you're sort of used to doing this and really know what's going on. But you can see there that I've got a really sort of good sense of um, that selection now. And that's a lot sort of easier to deal with. Now, you can tell if I just sort of turn that layer off, 
um, the, the one that was sort of crunching it down. Now you can see that's sort of what I've got under here. And this is what the actual original lines are going to look like. And it, it can be worthwhile using that as a view to kind of help us clean up some of these edges because you'll find this is going to give you a much better view of what the finished thing will look like. As with all of this, the more you're dealing with a cover, you know, highly polished illustration, the more you're going to want to go through and zoom up, make all of these things clean. You could easily spend an hour, two hours here. That would be time well spent if you're going to spend 20, 25 hours on the image overall. Make sure that all of these lines, all of these things are super clean, etc. What I'm doing here is I'm aiming more for a one to two hour sort of coloring process. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. But just keep in mind, again, this is just about sort of effort and focus. How much effort do you want to put in there? And yeah, like what's your what's your goal? What's your expectation? What finished result do you want? Mostly what I'm going to try and do is make sure, again, there's no big blobs of uh, pink mask over here and that there's no sort of giant holes in the middle of the character. As long as that's happening, we are good. Now, again, here is where you can use this mask or this selection to create another set of layers. But you could, as I talk about in the Quick Start Guide, use some selection and action tools to help you. So the actions that I can use here will essentially create a set of flat layers from this point and automate that entire process. So there you go. You can see that's sort of what's happened. It's created a very sort of nice set of flats. But um, another way you could sort of do that, if we undo all of this, if we're back at our mask stage, what I can do is go is hit Q. I'm out of quick mask. I'm going to hit Control Shift or Mac equivalent and I, and that's going to invert the selection. So you can see now I've got the opposite selected and I've got my new layer here, which I'm going to sort of put some flats on. And what I'm going to do is select, modify, contract. And I'm just going to contract by, again, uh, what, whatever sort of number of pixels is going to work. For me, this is a really big canvas. So I can probably pull this in by, you know, two sort of pixels and what that's going to do is it's going to take that original selection, right? And it's just sucking it in by a few pixels. And probably you can see here, I can actually afford to suck that in even more. So I'm going to do select, modify, contract. And I'm going to take it in by about five pixels. And that's going to sort of suck this line in here. Boom, right? And sort of take it in a little bit more. You could see, again, we could probably... Um, you know, sort of take it in even more if you wanted. But let's check this out, see how we go with this. Now, the actions that I have there that you get with the Quick Start Guide also sort of talk about, um, you know, how you can sort of soften this edge, tweak this edge, modify it a little bit. But this does a really, really good job. It will also be creating a couple of pockets of sort of empty stuff here. But again, we'll fill them in in a second. So now all I'm going to do is just hit um, Alt Backspace which uh, will sort of fill um, again, or you can just sort of hit fill and that's going to give me a layer here. Now, the next thing I've got to do is uh, because it probably had a few pixels full of sort of empty space here and there, we've sort of expanded those and that's created this look. So I can just go through here and sort of clean those up. These are things that typically if you have cleaner digital lines, you don't have to do any of that sort of cleanup. But uh, again, you know, or if you did a better job at the masking phase, then you won't need to do that. But again, as you can see, five seconds later, those are all gone. And part of the process is you spotting those, understanding, you know, how to sort of tweak all the different little parts of your own sort of process. And uh, again, you know, get off to a good start. The next thing we're going to do is start to consider the overall composition and how we can use this selection here to help us compose the initial tonal layout. So there's two main considerations here. First is, as I said, tonal layout. Secondary is the color scheme. What are we gonna do for the colors? Now, you can probably dice this a couple of few basic ways. If you're after a simple plan, a simple process that's likely to work, we really have to just consider whether or not the character is a sort of light character on a dark background or whether they're a dark character on a light background. So that's just defining 
the basic tonal layout of the image. Now, what we can do, again, there's a million different ways you can sort of think about how to frame these sort of concepts, but you can also just experiment and you can use this um, sort of process to experiment a little bit. Now, one of the things I find is kind of useful is to start with fairly light colors and sort of use that as a good way to sort of get your your sort of grounding or your initial sort of tonal layout there. Don't start too dark because what you'll find is then that that is going to sort of immediately start to compete with the lines and sort of maybe throw you off. So I'm going to sort of start with values in the kind of upper range. Again, definitely above sort of 50%. Here from a color perspective, I'm using the HSB sliders. B is going to adjust the balance. S is the saturation or sort of intensity of the color. And the H is the hue, i.e. which tube of paint. So here I've got this uh, sort of background color. And what I want to do is just lock the transparency of my sort of flat color layer, which is this guy here. Or it is also the question mark slash forward slash key that will um, do that for you as well. Again, a lot of these things can vary depending on your sort of international keyboard layout, but that's what it is for me. So now that's locked. And again, if I hit Alt, Alt, back, Alt Backspace, that's going to fill that with that color let's make it a little bit darker and there we go we've sort of got sort of an initial separation of the character and the background so when you're planning these things what i don't want to do is sort of go into an extensive tutorial about sort of tonal layout color options and those kind of things what i'll do is explain the process how I, the, the way that i would normally derive a plan the first thing that I'm going to do is think about, again, do I want a dark background or a light background? We'll start here by going with a light background and a dark character. I think that's going to sort of work for the sort of the general sort of feeling that we've got here. And in that case, again, I want this background to be pretty bright and I want the character to be a little bit darker, but not too dark in the beginning. From a color perspective, what we have to do, and my advice is often to start with what you know. I know that this is an orc character or a fantasy monster character. What we know about them is they're either green or, you know, some kind of sepia, sort of muddy, animalistic sort of skin color. Um, but they're going to be sort of like an earthy tone. Now... What I want to do is sort of think about what other colors go with that. So the first step is to sort of think about, again, what other elements might be on this character and how can I sort of put them in first? And then we'll sort of think about the background and some of these other elements to go with it. Now, again, we could start with the basic orcs are green color scheme and sort of play around with that. We don't want to make it too crazy green. There's a lot of ways you can sort of tweak this. What I would often do, I'm going to again make a new layer. I'm going to attach this to with a clipping mask to the Photoshop um, layer underneath it. And what I'm going to do again is make a new layer there. So I've got a little nice little sort of layer stack there. You can sort of see it a little bit easier. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use a brush pencil, which it still gives me a really graphic look, but it's a little bit more forgiving in terms of uh, initially sort of blocking things in. And what I'm going to do is roughly block in this skin and use this as a base to sort of think about what colors things need to be. Again, a good way to think about what colors things need to be is to sort of adjust them on the fly and use the elements of Photoshop to help us choose. So again, I'm just quickly making the skin green, but what we'll do is play around with that in a second. Got the hand here. And got this here. Right, so again, we've got that basic idea. And maybe what we'll also have is some sense of like, well, these are kind of furs or 
animal skins or something like that. So this is going to be a sort of brownie color. Now at this stage, what I'm doing is just preparing the separate elements. So don't worry if you're at this stage and, and things don't look right. It's important here that we focus on just making sure we sort of prepare the separate elements so that we can go in there and adjust them later on. So here I've got, again, most of those things. And I think that's probably enough to start with. So I'm just creating these things backwards because that's actually quite um, an easy, sort of effective way to do it. I'm just sort of painting under each of these tones. Let's make that a little bit bigger. So I'm going to make this, again, more of like a, a sort of sepia tone there. And again, that's giving me a little bit more of that fantasy vibe. We can tweak all of this later, and I will do a major tweaking pass um, right at the end in terms of colors. So again, what we're mostly doing here is just thinking about tonal arrangements, thinking about what color is there, and then kind of, you know, checking it out and saying like, does that look any good? You know, what, what is going on? So the last thing I'll do is I'll add a more sort of gray metallic color for this axe. This method of working is something that I recommend a lot. It's something that I, I'm frequently sort of teaching. And the core of it is just basically that you want to think about what is going to be there first, put it in, see what it looks like, see what it feels like. And, you know, don't worry about stuff, you know, un until you've kind of made those first steps. This means that, again, I'm starting, I'm, I'm working through the image and I'm sort of able to block it out. So we're starting to be able to look at it and assess it from a thumbnail standpoint. Now, again, there's many, many different things we can do. At this point, what I can do is select that orc green. I can go control U or Mac equivalent, and we can actually sort of play around with what sort of color we want it to be, right? I can sort of think about, hey, you know, how, right? Like how, how much of a green do I want it to be? Do we want it to be, you know, like, a, a, again, like the fluoro green or a more sort of realistic green? Again, these things are totally up to you. So what I'm going to do is gay, say, well, yeah, it, it's green, but, you know, it's not day glow green. It, it's not like a Warcraft orc green. And the next thing I'm going to do is select sort of this color, which is the skin color. I'm going to make it a little bit brighter. Um, I'm going to make it a little bit more saturated. And I'm going to make it a little bit more... sort of warm there and maybe a little bit brighter still there we go and I'm gonna think about again that animalistic two-tone look where we often have one part of the animal that is a little bit lighter than the other often you have the sort of the underside of the animal is sort of one color and the back is the other which helps from a general sort of camouflage standpoint again i feel like this could be boom even a little bit more extreme what i could do here again is turn contiguous off let's select all of that color i'm going to go control h control u and again we can sort of tweak these sliders a little bit and you know adjust that on the fly right see if we can get a good feel there so this is one of these techniques i use frequently is i'll put the tonality in i'll put the thing in there and then what i'm going to do is tweak it with sliders and, and sort of use my eye so that i'm not putting stuff in and using my eye at the same time so you can see again this shifts it a little bit more towards a realistic version of that you can see that this uh, axe now looks very sort of artificial and cartoony. I'm going to select that, control U. Oh, let's go control D to deselect what we had selected. 
uh, control U again brings up our hue saturation and I'm just going to pull the saturation down on that axe right and again tweak the, the levels of it a little bit maybe push it from a color point of view make it a little bit yellower so it blends in so now again you can see I've got starting to get the general idea of what this might look like um, there's a couple of things that I also want to do I'm gonna select the green of the orc and maybe make this sort of grass that's here on the ground that same kind of green so you can see I'm being very loose here and what I found is that sometimes that looseness will really work for me going forward it'll sort of you know continue to, to sort of function sometimes it'll it'll be a huge sort of pain and I have to clean it up but either way I'm getting off to uh, a start sort of quickly and this allows me to kind of move through the image so again you know I, I you see I can kind of change this color a little bit right make it sort of darker lighter play around with it and yeah just kind of see right like what do, what do I want what is gonna work there again hard to know with these things uh, I feel like that was yeah a little bit a little bit strong maybe boom let's go something like that so now we've got the background and oh, and now that we've got the character kind of blocked in now what I'm gonna do is think about background color and a primary sort of tenant that you can use from color theory that sort of will you know tend to always work is just function within warm or cool colors I'm dealing with a very sort of somber more realistic palette here so I don't need to go day go bl day glow blue in the background but thinking about you know how blue we want this in the background is really important and let's just sort of try a color a little bit like the axe there from a blue standpoint and sort of see how that works so you can see now we've got a you know sort of pretty good color contrast but now I no longer have this light background versus the character so again as, as long as we have sort of warm cool contrast this will kind of always always pop so again this doesn't look that good to me I'm sort of looking at it and I'm like I'm starting to sort of mas massage it but it's not yet at a stage where I'm like oh yeah this is sort of this is the direction I want to go one of the things that you can always play with is tweaking the color of these lines and a simple way we can do that is we can add a selective color um, adjustment layer to our stack of different colors uh, sorry our different sort of line layers here and what I'm going to do here is move the neutral colors let's zoom up so we can see a little bit more so what this is doing is it's affecting just these lines right so if I sort of make them all red right it's gonna make them all all sort of red right if I make them all purple or green right I've got pretty good freedom here to kind of make them what whatever I want um, what we want to do is again select the neutrals and I'm sort of going to make them a sort of red sepia tone right so we're going to push the magenta we're going to pull the cyan down I use selective color because I find it it kind of typically does a lot of what I what I kind of want here um, but you can use whatever color adjustment tool you want next I'm going to select the blacks and I'm actually going to sort of pull the sort of blues in those blacks a little bit out right really sort of make them sort of pop and you can also you know push the the overall value of the blacks down using the the black slider here and what I'm going to do is take the whites anything that's kind of sort of subtle I'm going to, I'm going to make it kind of very yellow and uh, what that will do hopefully is give us a nice sort of look to these lines right where again they've got sort of a fantasy sepia look and that's going to work well 
Now, you can obviously play with and adjust the levels by playing around and adjusting the levels within that layer stack. And now we can see how they're being affected by that color and both the color underneath them. So again, what I find is this is a really good thing to do now to kind of help make sure that everything sort of fits together. Another thing that is sort of worth trying in terms of uh, thinking about this sort of background color is we had a lot of movement here when we were dealing with this initial sketch, right? There's a feeling of some movement here in the drawing. We had some sense of sort of lines going through here that have some movement. So I can sort of put that in and think about whether that sort of movement in the background is, is going to help. So again, this is, deal, this is starting to become a little bit more of a monotone color scheme. And that's okay because the feeling I want is a little bit more of a realistic coloring on this. It's not really super cartoony in terms of, you know, the way the, the drawing was done. There's, you know, a lot of anatomy there. What I mostly want to focus on is, is also sort of rendering it. Adding some shadows, adding some highlights. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just adjust and tweak all of these lines so that all of these flats so that it's a little bit better. I've got the basic idea here and I'm just going to make a new layer over the top of everything and use my same pencil -y brush tool with 100% opacity and I'm just going to go in and sort of paint essentially the flat color here. So I'm after a sense of flat color that is going to help me accentuate the pencil drawing. Now you'll notice that I'm, you know, I'm being sort of brushy with it and I'm specifically using a lot of this brushiness in the flat brush to help me, you know, make things feel sketchy, right? You know, I don't need things to look super clean. It's not really what we're doing here. And it's going to give that initial sort of block in a little bit more of a looser feel, which I think is often really, really useful to make sure that, you know, it, it's clear that this is not meant to be hyper, hyper detailed. So there we go. Again, just kind of finessing this and, and you can finesse this, you know, to a, to a fairly high degree. We don't need to, you, you get basically just stop when you get sick of it, right? Um, how, how far do you need to go? So this is where, again, what I'm going to start to do is add a little bit of finesse to these little pouches and things, right? We're going to take the colors there and I'm just sort of making them a little bit darker, right? You know, and I'm just going to play around with, oh, this one's a little bit darker than this one, um, right? Maybe this one's a little bit sort of more red than some of the others. And we're just going to play around with that a little bit here and a little bit there. Again, I've got some more of those little sort of ropes and bits and pieces around the place. And we can just clean up some of these lines. The other basic color that's probably good to be there is sort of a white, right? We sort of want a, um, a bone kind of color here because we've got some sort of teeth and other little bone trinkets. Now this is rough and part of what you're seeing is again, I have a good idea and I have a lot of experience figuring out how rough I can make this and still kind of go over the top and, and use a lot of blending and tricks in, in the end. So stick around for the, the whole thing. You kind of see how this comes together. But a big part of developing your sort of professional abilities is knowing when to sort of adjust that initial block in, right? So to know like, you know what, this is just not going to work. And when you know, look, this is probably going to work. It just needs me to really focus on these details and, uh, you know, follow through it. That, that, that is the, one of the hardest things to master is just getting that balance right. But here I'm pretty confident if I sort of go through and, and start playing around with this, that we'll be able to get to a, a sort of good point in the end. 
and I need to play around uh, in, in, in a big way with that face and get that kind of working. So here I'm going to make that brush opacity 50%, go through here and just with one stroke adjust that, do the same thing here, boom, boom, boom. Uh, take this one and again sort of paint in the straps on this axe. That looks like it's meant to be the original kind of axe there. Again, think about trying to add a little bit of oh, nuance to it. Now you might find that one of the frustrating things about having pencil lines is that when you're selecting colors you kind of are selecting like a mix of the pencil and a mix of the line. So you know if I select here you can see I'm actually getting the underlying color plus right the line that's on top of it. You can with your sort of eyedropper tool make sure that you only select the current layer that is a setting but one of the things I found and one of the reasons I sort of adjust the flats the sorry the lines to have much more sort of sepia tonality is I find that this way if I sort of select colors that are a little bit you know affected by those lines they tend to get sort of warmer right so again I feel like that is sort of better than it getting gray and mushy it's one of the major reasons that I you know always started making these lines sepia so all right let's play around with these teeth let's select this color what I'm going to do is make it a lot more saturated, a lot more red, and let's just see what's going to happen there. So the reason I do that is because I want the tone or the balance, the value of these um, sort of lips and, and the teeth there to really match the value of the skin. I just want it to be sort of a different saturation and a different, different color. Here I'm going to go down here, select the white of that bone so it kind of matches here and let's put in these teeth. Now if we look at the actual flats here, if we take away the lines, you can see in most cases this is super, super rough. Again, that is part of the process and that's part of where I'm calculating what is going to matter, what's going to show through, what's not going to show through, etc, etc, etc. Here again, we're starting to get to a point where I can kind of see, you know, whether this is going to look any good, whether we're going to need to tweak it. So I've just selected this color. I've set the opacity to 50% using keyboard shortcuts, and that allows me to go in there and sort of add a few little bits and pieces. Now, again, there's many, many different ways you could play around with this. There's many, many different ways you could, um, you know, take this further, adding shadows, um, playing around with the initial um, the initial kind of colors. You could do a lot of shading just with the flat colors. Again, that's totally up to you. What I'm going to do is think about adding some shadows with a separate layer. Before we jump into shadows, though, I think there's a couple of things we can say at this point. Firstly is just to address the idea of like how you might be feeling about your image personally. Now again, for me, at this point, I'm still not convinced this is going in a good direction. And that's often the case. It's often the case that I'm not really sure how this is going. And a lot of these things are in flux. What I normally just have that might be different to the me of sort of 15, 20 years ago is just that I have a lot more solutions that I've sort of played around with over time and I've got a lot of different sort of ways I can sort of play around with this and sort of make it work but it's important to understand that if you're not quite sure what direction it's going that the best solution is just to move forward and sort of start to solve things that you do know need solving that's where again we start to play around with the idea of adding just you know all of these flat colors making sure all of that stuff is there. Now, you could do the same with the shading and sort of leave the tweaking and the color adjustment to later, but you can also do something that I think is really helpful, which is to think about the overall image composition now 
and try and sort of solve that first. One of the most important things that I always found worked was to not really go past the flat color stage until it was looking good. And I almost sort of told myself that you should try and get the flat color stage to a point where you almost don't want to add stuff to it. You don't want to add shading to it because it kind of works well as is. And I think that's still a really, really good option and way to think about this. So what I'm going to do is sort of play with the overall composition and add a few textural elements. And I'm going to actually do that before we start thinking about the shading. So let's look at how we might do that. The things that we have at our disposal are overall color adjustments where we can use color theory to help pull focus where we want, i.e. probably around the character's face is our primary read. The, the axe and the rest of the stuff is probably our secondary read. And then sort of the background and that kind of stuff is our tertiary read. Now with this type of image, you know, there's not a lot of stuff in the tertiary read. It's mostly just a matter of making sure we pull focus towards the character's face. So what I'm going to do is add some texture because again, I think that might help this a little bit. And the second thing that I'll do is I'll play with the overall tonality, i.e. can we adjust the character so that, you know, it's the focus is more on their face basically. And, you know, can we use some color adjustments to make sure that, again, we've got warm colors coming forward and that, again, color theory is helping us with our hierarchy and our sort of areas that we want to focus in. So let's make a new layer. And what I'm going to do is select some sort of of these splatter textures. And what I'm going to do in, in this case is just try and... add a little bit of stuff to the background. So now I'm going to hit let put the opacity down and go over again. And this is just creating a sort of floor of noise, right? So that we don't get a feeling that again this stuff is too graphic. And that also means that to a certain degree what we might have is that the the, the texture of the background is going to start to match with the texture of these sort of lines and stuff. What it also does is gives us some very micro color adjustment vibrancy. So we've kind of got multiple colors here overlaying each other and we're gonna get a more vibrant sort of high end look that way. And it means if people do view your art really high resolution, uh, in really high resolution, there's gonna be something there for them to look at as opposed to just flat color. I'm gonna do a similar thing making a layer between here and we're just going to see if we can I'll up the opacity of that and see if we can kind of blend in some of these flat graphic shapes a little bit and get some yeah just a little bit more of a dynamic look here now again this is not always going to be the answer this is not always going to be what works but it can really really help now again another thing that I might try is select a really low opacity version of that and we'll go over the entire character and see if we can add again some of that feeling of texture to the whole character. I actually have a whole video just on adding texture to the um, sort of image and again I'll put that in the link uh, I'll put a link for that in the description below. Another trick that I think is really useful here is to create a second version of your image. You do that by going window, arrange, new window. And what I'm going to do is drag that up to my second monitor so that I can have a really good view of um, you know what that image looks like when it's a little bit smaller. Now I'm still trying to get the feeling for that motion there, which I feel like has been lost somewhat. So I put some of that texture in there. I feel like that's kind of working okay to do, you know, kind of what I need. What I'm going to do is select the, I'm going to go up to the pencil, the brush pencil. And again, I'm going to try and see if I can get this to work. So again, that's working. There we go. I got it working. 
And what I'm going to do here is just create some larger areas of this texture, right? We're going to try and break it up a little bit more. Create some sort of patterns and just keep keep doing that, right? Keep seeing whether adding some of that motion will help us. Again, start to think here about how we can add some brush stroke looks. See if that might work. Again, hard to tell. And most of these things that I'm doing, uh, um, you know, in, in the vast majority of cases, I'm just experimenting, right? I'm just playing around. I don't have any more idea how it's going to work than, you know, in anyone else than you or, you know. <laughs> um, and again, I think that's really important to state that, you know, no process is going to be sort of, you know, a perfect sort of linear process. You have to experiment, especially when we're kind of making it up like this, right? We, we, we're really just playing around and experimenting as we go. If I wanted to be more reliable here, as I said in that first video, one of the things that I would do is make sure that, you know, we did a proper grayscale rough for this. We planned it out, experiment with the colors, initially think about it in better, you know, more high fidelity detail. Um, here, we're just kind of making stuff up and, and that's, again, totally fine. It's a different type of process. So I'm going to, again, see if we can, oh, let's going to pull down that opacity a little bit, see if we can put some of this texture here. We've got this on a, on a new layer. So that's going in a bit, a bit hard. Now, again, your ability to play around with sort of brushes and, you know, get these sort of subtle effects very, very much is, is to do with how, how keyed in you are with your tool. So this is, again, not the normal sort of Wacom tool that I'm, use, that I'm used to. And that means that it's a little bit more challenging for me to use the brushes exactly how I would normally do it. I've often, you know, talked to students and we've sort of dealt exactly with this kind of stuff where you know I'll, I'll be able to get a lot more sort of subtlety than they are and you know it, it just comes down to the the very precise way you have your sort of tablet set up whether you uh you know have the have the sensitivity just down enough so that you know it's you're going to be able to pick up these kind of subtle uses of particular tools you might need to tweak the tools a little bit Again, these things are about you learning to use your tool and really, really getting deep with it. You know, no, don't, don't, don't get too worried if, you know, these things don't turn out perfectly the first time. Your goal is to learn how to use the subtleties and the nuances of the tool so that, you know, in the long run, you have a really, really good sense for it. That is not going to work if, you know, you sort of try it once and then run away. Um... And, you know, that's what you might find. You can download a brush pack. You can download, you know, the this exact brush is, is part of that sort of quick start guide. You can see how I use it. But um, even for me, you know, if I swap the, the drawing tablet brand, that means the pressure sensitivity that I'm normally using with this particular brush is a little bit different. And I sort of have to recalibrate. Now, you could bring up the um, calibration tools of the actual um, you know, tablet device and play around with that. But again, a lot of it is just tweaking your hand, right? Getting used to a certain amount of pressure that you're expecting. So what I'm doing here is kind of like a similar thing to, I guess, sort of speed lines or something like that. I'm sort of adding some, some sort of visual interest here and just kind of scumbling around, right? Just kind of like sort of sketching around with the with the brush and, and trying to fill in that background, right? This background kind of just looked very sort of flat. And again, what I, what I want to do is try and make sure that it feels a little bit more complicated. Now, yeah, again, as, as I always say, it, it's not necessarily the case that I'm sort of sitting there saying, yep, that's good. That's working perfectly now. There's, there's a lot of these things where, you know, I'm playing around and it's not necessarily 
sort of working how I want. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, keep, keep going through, keep playing around, keep seeing what might work, what might not work, right? So I'm going to go in here, see if like adding again, a little bit of that sort of balance here might work. It might be good to, again, get rid of some of that sort of lightness there that might help us kind of, you know, build and, and draw some contrast towards that face as opposed to kind of leaving it open uh, yeah just just experiment so again I've added some texture and we'll see how this works right I can turn these off we can play around with this I can also tweak the lines what I'm going to do again is try and sort of do a pass that approximates adjusting the sort of hierarchy, making sure we sort of look at the main part of this orc that's important. And yeah, just get a lot of those big questions answered. So I'm going to go back to the, um, where are we? This one, I think, yeah, I think that's the right brush. Let's make a new layer. Right, and I've got this brush again, and I'm just going to sort of soften and push back a lot of that work that I did previously. All right, again, let's just sort of get it so it's not quite so strong. I'm going to do the same with the background, new layer, All right, and let's tweak that. All right, sort of blend that in a bit see how that goes again it might be a little bit much might be not enough we'll see um, at the end of the day we can sort of knock it back with the airbrush anyway we can also think about doing the same thing over the top of the character and see how that looks there we go I got it working and what I'm going to do here is just create some larger areas of this texture, right? We're going to try and break it up a little bit more. Create some sort of patterns and just keep, keep doing that, right? Keep seeing whether adding some of that motion will help us. Again, start to think here about how we can add some brush stroke looks see if that might work again hard to tell and most of these things that I'm doing uh, um, you know in, in the vast majority of cases I'm just experimenting right I'm just playing around I don't have any more idea how it's going to work than you know in anyone else than you or you know <laughs> Um, and again, I think that's really important to state that, you know, no process is going to be sort of, you know, a perfect sort of linear process. You have to experiment, especially when we're kind of making it up like this, right? We, we, we're really just playing around and experimenting as we go. If I wanted to be more reliable here, as I said in that first video, one of the things that I would do is make sure that, you know, we did a proper grayscale rough for this. We planned it out, experiment with the colors, initially think about it in better, you know, more high fidelity detail. Um, here, we're just kind of making stuff up and, and that's, again, totally fine. It's a different type of process. So I'm going to, again, see if we can, oh, let's gonna pull down that opacity a little bit, see if we can put some of this texture here got this on a on a new layer so that's going in a bit a bit hard now again your ability to play around with sort of brushes and you know get these sort of subtle effects very very much is is to do with how how keyed in you are with your tool so this is again not the normal sort of wake on tool that I'm used that I'm used to and that means that it's a little bit more challenging for me to use the brushes exactly how I would normally do it. I've often, you know, talked to students and we've sort of dealt 
exactly with this kind of stuff where you know I'll, I'll be able to get a lot more sort of subtlety than they are and you know it, it just comes down to the the very precise way you have your sort of tablet set up whether you uh you know have the have the sensitivity just down enough so that you know it's you're going to be able to pick up these kind of subtle uses of particular tools you might need to tweak the tools a little bit again these things are about you learning to use your tool and really really getting deep with it you know no, don't 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 get too worried if you know these things don't turn out perfectly the first time your goal is to learn how to use the subtleties and the nuances of the tool so that you know in the long run you have a really really good sense for it that is not going to work if you know you sort of try it once and then run away um and you know that's what you might find you can download a brush pack you can download you know the this exact brush is is part of that sort of quick start guide you can see how i use it but um even for me you know if i swap the the drawing tablet brand that means the pressure sensitivity that i'm normally using with this particular brush is a little bit different and i sort of have to recalibrate now you could bring up the um, calibration tools of the actual um, you know tablet device and play around with that but again a lot of it is just tweaking your hand right getting used to a certain amount of pressure that you're expecting so what i'm doing here is kind of like a similar thing to i guess sort of speed lines or something like that i'm sort of adding some some sort of visual interest here and just kind of scumbling around right just kind of like sort of sketching around with the with the brush and, and trying to fill in that background, right? This background kind of just looked very sort of flat. And again, what I what I want to do is try and make sure that it feels a little bit more complicated. Now, yeah, again, as, as I always say, it, it's not necessarily the case that I'm sort of sitting there saying, yep, that's good. That's working perfectly now. There's, there's a lot of these things where, you know, I'm playing around and it's not necessarily sort of working how I want. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, keep keep going through, keep playing around, keep seeing what might work, what might not work, All right? So I'm gonna go in here, see if like adding, again, a little bit of that sort of balance here might work. It might be good to, again, get rid of some of that sort of lightness there. That might help us kind of, you know, build and, and draw some contrast towards that face as opposed to kind of leaving it open uh, yeah just just experiment so again I've added some texture and we'll see how this works right I can turn these off we can play around with this I can also tweak the lines what I'm going to do again is try and sort of do a pass that approximates adjusting the sort of hierarchy, making sure we sort of look at the main part of this orc that's important. And yeah, just get a lot of those big questions answered. So I'm going to go back to the, um, where are we? This one, I think, yeah, I think that's the right brush. Let's make a new layer. Right, and I've got this brush again. And I'm just gonna sort of soften and push back a lot of that work that I did previously. All right, again, let's just sort of get it so it's not quite so strong. I'm gonna do the same with the background, new layer. All right, and let's tweak that. All right, sort of blend that in a bit see how that goes again it might be a little bit much might be not enough we'll see um, at the end of the day we can sort of knock it back with the airbrush anyway we can also think about doing the same thing over the top of the character and see how that looks so just putting a bit of that sort of dark texture over everything again with all these things, we can pull it back or push it forward. What I want to play with now is the overall gradient. And what we can, we can literally use the gradient tool to do this. Let's 
select some, again, these are not the normal gradients I would have because it's you know, default install of Photoshop. But here, right, we can think about it like this, where we literally create a gradient going up across the character. And you can see that that is kind of pulling our focus much more towards this version of the character. Now I can reduce the opacity a little bit and I could control U, decrease the darkness, right? So that means I'm sort of getting a similar result to what I had sort of there, but it's, I'm, sh I'm showing a little bit of that texture. But again, I kind of like the, the flatness here. I feel like that's kind of working as a good contrast between the, between the background. Let's play around with that. New, another new layer down here. And what I'm gonna do is, right, again, pull up. Let's see whether we can create a similar sort of effect there. Right, so again, sort of pulling some of that down. Let's see if we get rid of some of that. That might work, or we could pull the dark down. Either way, the goal is to try and pull some focus around here so that we're kind of looking more at that character. We could now switch to the airbrush. So I'm gonna hit B for brush. Let's get to the brush. And I have my airbrush selected here, big airbrush, and I'm going to make a new layer. And in this case, again, what we can think about is potentially, you know, using a, let's just try overlay, see whether that works. And I'm going to select the skin color because I know it's lighter. And in this way, what we can do is probably reduce the saturation of that. Right, we can just kind of pull some focus towards the character's face. Now again, this is probably, you know, quite a bit. You know, we, we probably don't need to go go quite that far everywhere because we can we can push this and pull this later on. Right? But again, it's important to sort of note how we can we can draw that and, and pull that face out. So if we sort of zoom out, right, we can start to see that there's a little bit more of a one, two, three read there. Uh, there's a little bit more sort of interest going on from, from my perspective anyway. And again, to me, it sort of feels a little bit more interesting. We can also try that with, again, sort of color. So we use an overlay and another sort of warm color. And I've set this to about sort of 50, which will work with an overlay. And again, we can try and sort of pull out that and then play around with that color, right? And see what it's gonna take for us to really sort of get a strong read there. So again, to me, that looks like it's working a little bit better just from, you know, sort of an interest standpoint, right? There's a little bit more of an overall sort of color thing going on there. I've got the line. So what I'll do now is we'll play around with adjusting these lines a bit. So that's sort of what we had there. Let's try some levels, see if we can sort of crunch these lines down a little bit more. Right, just get a little bit more that we can. Again, we don't need to we don't need to go too far to see if we can sort of punch that a little bit more. Now, one thing you can do is kind of say, yeah, but I don't want any of that sort of extra contrast around the face. I just want it somewhere else. And so again, that's something that's very, very easy, very, very easy to do. All we do is just put a mask on those levels and say, hey, n none of that contrast I just added over here. We could also see here now, you know, what happens if I do turn off that, um, you know, that white that I sort of took off everywhere, right? You know, I had all that sort of extra sketchiness and I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe maybe that does look better, you know, with a bit of sketchiness, you know, it makes it feel a little bit more dynamic. 
we can also play around with you know all of these other sort of general sort of levels that are going on there um, you know that was the one we had there for the selections we can also play around with our selective color maybe make those darks again a little bit bluer all right we can sort of pull them down a little bit And again, to me, if we sort of take those off, right, that's where they were, put them back on, it's just adding a little bit more of that sort of drama. So we've got them off, and then on, just a little bit of extra. Again, these, these things are pretty subtle. Um, you know, it's the sort of thing that might not even come through when we're dealing with the, um, you know, YouTube algorithm kind of chomping this down, but uh, yeah, little bits can often make a big difference in terms of contrast. Now there's still a few of these kind of flats that I think we could sort of add in, and what we can play around with there is, yeah, you know, let's let's take some of these bits and pieces off and go back to where we were here. And now that I'm more confident that that overall sort of look is going to work I'm like yeah I feel like we can improve our one two three read right I feel like that's going to work better let's go back to our initial drawing and let's see if we can just clean this up and spend a few minutes making sure that this feels a little bit more professional so this process again is this is sort of what I do and, and this is a little bit of a difference between Again, my approach to teaching is to try and do a mix of sort of, hey, this is how you sort of should do it, right? But this is how I also actually do it. And so if you check out, you know, the other tutorials on the channel, again, there's a big mix between these two concepts. Often, the more experience you get, the more you might want to play around and do these kind of things that I'm doing here where, you know, I'm kind of pointlessly just playing around and experimenting and that might not be the most sort of professional way to do it or if you were teaching that might not be what you would sort of suggest that someone do but um, I do a mix of sort of talking about what the best practices are and then also sharing with you how I tend to actually work you know especially when you know if you look at a lot of the other real-time fully narrated tutorials where I'm dealing with this in Photoshop um, uh, where again I'm you know just sort of creating images and doing it real time fully narrated you see I often am just sort of making these leaps of faith and playing around and experimenting and that's because I've had many many years experience doing this and part of what you can do to sort of uh, again you know it depends where you are on your journey with this you might already be at that stage where that's totally easy you might not be but the thing is that um, very often your ability to experiment and push those boundaries and, and sort of wing it is built on a foundational set of knowledge where, again, you do it the right way, you're a little bit more systematic about it. But as I said in the first part of this, where we did this drawing, this skill of being able to kind of look at the image and say, hey, you know what, like this isn't working, right? This way I thought it was going to work is not working how can I what tools do I have to fix this again you know that tool of saying let's see what it looks like once I add some color adjustments you know once I go through and add all the, the fancy stuff and make it look fancy like is is this actually going to be worth it do I need to you know think about the color in more detail do, do I need to um, you know really step back and change this or, or is it just a matter of kind of you know, you put all put in all the detail and you sort of tick all the boxes and cross all the T's and dot all the I's and then it sort of comes together. Again, it, it can be a real mix between these different realities. You just never sort of know until you get in there with that particular image and, and actually, you know, have a crack at it and, and see what happens. Um, and as you build a, you know, a career and a, and a long time messing around with these things, you, you get a, an improved spidey sense for when it's going to work, when it's not going to work, 
when you're going to need to you know, experiment, when you're going to need to move laterally. And it's often that lateral movement that, you know, is the most fun. You know, that's often where it feels like, you know, a lot of stuff is possible. Um, you know, we can, we can pay attention to happy accidents. We can experiment. And that's a lot how that's that's a lot of how these kind of processes go. Where I think that's necessary if you're dealing with this type of art, where you know we we are totally just you know winging it a little bit. You know we're just having fun, messing around, do, doing this kind of sketchier style of art that yeah you know just doesn't 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 work very well um, if you're if you're not willing to experiment and play around. So. The trick is that when you're beginning your journey doing this, it really, really pays to pick images that are simple, right? So in the beginning, really, really focus on picking images and doing things that are simple plans, things that you're, you're very sort of confident are going to work. So again, we could continue this way. You know, I'm basically just painting with flat colors and, you know, viewing this as a, you know, very much as just a flat painting. We can keep going this way. What we could also do is turn on a lot of those layers that we had. So we turn these all back on. I think if they all go back on, yeah, that looks kind of cool. And now we've got all that sort of stuff there. Now, this still doesn't feel like it has the kind of the finished contrast that we need, but I think the one, two, three read here is a little bit more interesting. And I feel like I'm at a good place now to, over the top of all of that, start to add some shading to this character. So I'm going to make a new layer there, and I'm going to hit the brush, get back, shift B until I get back to the actual brush tool. And then I'm going to select this brush which is basically just again one of these basic photoshop brushes and i'm going to pick a sort of muddy saturated Let's see if we can increase the saturation of this right i'm just sort of picking a, a muddy brown and i'm setting it to a low opacity And that's going to give me a shadow. Now, you can play around with exactly what you sort of need to use in terms of um, multiply or hard light. I'm actually just using a normal layer. I'm painting on it with a dark color. And I'm just setting that opacity pretty low, in this case, to 50%. And what I'm doing is similar to, you know, if you're painting, right, you kind of test out how that is going to look. Now this is very similar to painting with watercolor or something. Because I'm painting with a low opacity, what I need to do is pay attention to not sort of um, finessing the the brush too much, right? I'm, I'm not. I don't want to overlay brush stroke on top of brush stroke. What I'm trying to do is think about it more like a watercolor, where I'm holding down and I'm making this as all one stroke. I'm not lifting off the page at all and this means that even though I'm painting transparently I'm still getting the same tonality of shadow everywhere and essentially what I'm going to do is just build this up right so I can keep building this up I can sort of keep pushing it and that will allow me to sort of get a pretty good block in of tone that I can then either just sort of leave or we can paint on top of it whatever Again, in most cases with this type of sketchy style of art, I, I'm really just going to do sort of one pass and then that'll probably be all we have time for. With most art, you know, especially, you know, comic book art or concept art where time is a major factor, it really is just a matter of doing the best you can in the given time. That's kind of the art that I like to do where we're always a little bit sort of pressed for time, doing the best we can. Uh, you know, if it fails, we'll, we'll try again next time. Uh, yeah, you know, like that's typically where I like to like to sit. Now you can see here this, the benefit of using this particular process. I've got 
pretty much the entire image there. The entire image is is kind of there. It's it's kind of working. I've I figured out a lot of those overall tonal things. And what I'm doing now is adding shadow. And because of, you know, the the wonders of digital technology, I'm basically able to kind of glaze over this and sort of almost draw with this brush, right? I'm able to kind of it, it, this is this is why I like it. It's very similar to kind of drawing where you kind of keep finessing, keep adding shadow, keep making it darker, keep playing around with it, right? Keep adding, keep adding. And, um, you know, I, I can sort of finesse this. I can push the those core shadows a little bit. I can add a little bit of texture, right? I can go in here and make this little shadow here a little bit darker. And... I kind of know at this stage, like when it's up, like when's it done? It, it's done because, you know, at, at some point I, I'm going to be seeing a picture that is a pretty close to, you know, the finished picture that I'm going to end up with. And this means that I, I'm less likely to get sort of too, um, sort of, yeah, sort of pernickety, too fussy with it, right? Because cause, cause I, I know how these strokes are going to look in the end. If we take these off, you can see it's a little bit harder to see how they're going to affect everything. Um, because, for instance, often what we do is, yeah, in order to maintain a good hierarchy of read, we will kind of knock down the value contrast around, you know, the legs like this. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, it, working this way is a lot more efficient because that way I'm, I'm not sort of rendering the hell out of this knee when in the end I'm just going to kind of go over it and... Um, you know, reduce all the contrast and, and basically sort of make it go away in the first place. Now, there's many different options for what you can do after this phase of coloring. You could obviously, you know, potentially, if, if, if you want, you know, start painting over the top of this. You could use this as a base. You could, you know, clean it up. We could add some highlights and we might add a few highlights to this. Uh, or again, you could just kind of say, hey, this is just a sketch. This is just, you know, my sort of one to, to three hour kind of, uh, you know, image. You could, uh, again, take it further. You could start to clean up the lines. You could play around with it, right? The world is your oyster in terms of what you do once you get it to a stage where, you know, it's kind of working. And that is uh, another really good way to think about this and, and one of the reasons why I tend to use more of these techniques where we get close to what the finished look is early on. It's, it's, it's one of those major tenets of concept art where you never know where you're going to kind of run out of time. So with concept art and with comics as well, again, these things where there's huge time pressure, one of the things is with concept art, the value that the concept art has in terms of iterating the design process and sort of saying, hey, we, we need some drawings today so that we can sort of make decisions for tomorrow and iterate and, you know, see how far we can get with this idea, with this design. Well, in that case, it's like saying, hey, it's not finished is no good because, well, it doesn't matter whether it's finished because we need to look at it in order to assess where to go next, right? So often what you always want to do with concept art is be able to get your images relatively soon to a stage where you can kind of send them off. Um, and that's where, again, this type of process, I feel like really sort of comes into its own because you can just kind of say, hey, uh, you know, at, at this point, we could kind of, you know, call it a day. The image is there. It kind of works. Um, we've got a sort of a decent hierarchy of read. But also, if I have another 10 minutes, right, if I've got another 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, right, I can often add a little bit more. I can sort of push the finesse and the fidelity of the art. And I think that's a really good place to be and a really good place to sort of think about being because at that point, you kind of have stress-free detail. So if you imagine it is, you know, my deadline is approaching, right? Let's just say in some fantastical world, you know, my, my workday ends at five, um, which being a freelancer is kind of rarely the case. I'm often working all sorts of weird hours, sometimes much to my benefit, right? Allowing me to do fun stuff in the day and whatever. But say that my day is, is finishing at five 
say your day is finishing at 5, and say we're at sort of 4.30 in the afternoon. Again, if I get my image to this place where I feel like, oh, okay, you know, at 10 to 5, I'm going to send an email to my client and say, hey, you know, here it is. Here's the next phase. Um, you know, it, that's fine because now I'm, I'm like, I'm pretty confident we've got something, right? There's something here. It's looking kind of okay. Obviously, it needs, you know, some some more finessing. And, and the more detail I add to it, the trickier it becomes, like the, the more detail you need to add to it, right? The more you do, the more you need to kind of add everywhere else, right? There is diminishing returns with this to a certain degree. But again, I'm at a point where I can kind of say, hey, if I just kind of keep adding detail, I'm going to keep making this better. And I have a much more relaxed kind of last hour to half an hour of my day. Oh, so I think there was a problem with the recording. So a little bit got skipped. What we sort of, um, what I sort of did um, here was basically just go through and sort of add some of that shading to the face because that's one of the important things. And one of the things I said there is that, uh, again, you know, while the recording was off, was that often a really good technique if you are sitting there with a short amount of time to go to finish an image is to say, okay, if I only had five minutes, if I only had a minute left to do, what is the number one thing that I can do to make this image better? So again, at that point, I kind of hadn't sort of quite done a lot of that rendering on the face. And so what I sort of noticed as I stepped back and said, okay, I need to sort of fix this stuff is that, yeah, I started to kind of go in there and add a lot of that rendering to the face, define the forms within the face and kind of get that working so that I have that primary read. So the next thing that I've sort of done that again was sort of like a little bit skipped, but is very, very similar to what you've seen here is just adding some highlights. Before I add highlights, what I did is just sort of went through the image though and made sure that we, we kind of just said like, hey, you know, there's some areas down here that, that just don't need to be, you know, quite, ha quite having, have the same contrast as these other areas that are really lit. So let's just kind of, you know, go through with a big brush and kind of just tone down some of these areas where, you know, again, with these abs, all of these abs are not facing the light. You know, they're sort of facing the side. The light looks like it's coming from the top. So, you know, we're not going to have any highlights down here near the near the abs, um, you know, down here where, you know, th that's going to be as bright as the forehead or the pectoral muscles or anything like that. So let's just tone them down. The next thing I did was add some highlights. Now, the technique here is exactly the same as what we were dealing with previously with the shadows. All I've got is exactly the same brush, but I'm using a a bright sort of white color. And all I'm doing is just sort of, again, sort of, you know, just slowly going through, ticking away at it, um, you know, building these things up using fairly low opacity. So again, that's 100%. Probably what I'd be doing here is, you know, just sort of using that sort of 40 to 20% and just going through and really kind of pushing and pulling these forms. If you want, a, you know, a really simple version of how this entire process goes, it's just a matter of sort of putting down those flats and then adding shadows and then adding highlights to it. So I'm just making those flats a little bit darker and lighter. And I'm just using a normal layer with a very dark color and a very light color. And I'm transparently pulling highlights and pushing shadows back. Very, very simple, effective process. But, you know, this kind of thing will always work. So that's basically the, the core of what we're doing. And I got to a stage where, you know, yeah, most of that is kind of done. You know, most of that is kind of working. So the next thing that I thought would be good to play around with is thinking about this background. And again, what I've done here is sort of, you know, make it darker and a little bit sort of cooler. And the second thing I did was kind of reduce the, the, the saturation of that, which makes it a little bit more gray which considering the whole image is kind of sepia toned meant that it really sort of came forward and sort of popped. Um, it's also important to note that working with this process on the characters, you notice that as I'm adding highlights, I can also add shadows, right? Because I've got these two colors that I'm sort of pushing for the shadows and the highlights. And again, I can still sort of just swap to the, to the dark 
on that sort of highlight layer and add in some shadows if I want. So a very sort of flexible process. If you're working with overlays and multiplies and that kind of thing, can be a little bit trickier to just go, hey, you know what, I want to paint. The other thing you can do with this entire thing is just say, hey, you know what, I literally just want this color to be over here, right? I want to paint this red and I want to paint it over here. And what you can do is once you've kind of blocked in all these things, you can actually start painting and, you know, finesse this and start to add more of like a painterly look to everything and, and really kind of go down there and, um, you know, make it less sort of processed looking. So again, that's something that you could do if you want to smooth out some of these um, features, you know, if maybe you've sort of pushed it a little bit far um, or whatever, or, you know, if you want to sort of pull the, you know, you might want to adjust the, the shadows from a tonal point of view, um, from a color point of view, etc., etc. So a very sort of flexible process. And, and I think, again, I like it a lot more than, you know, worrying too much about, um, yeah, you know, sort of hard light overlay, all that kind of stuff. The next thing I did is that I sort of pulled, if we sort of look at this as the overall sort of color adjustment on the character, just making things a little bit bluer, but then I used a select, I used a select color range, which uh, again is something if you've looked at any of the real time and fully narrated tutorials, you can see how I use that and I explain that in the quick start guide and we'll do a little bit more of it right now. So again, one of the other things we can do is we can try and push using that exact same technique. We can try and push, oh, yellow, right? We can try and push some of these reds. So if we want to go the opposite direction and really sort of push this, I can then go with the mask selected color range and we will kind of pull some of those shadows up here. And again, you can adjust the fuzziness or the, you know, anything like that. Now this is pretty extreme, but we can pull the opacity down on it. We can adjust that mask even more so that the this kind of, you know, warm, cool contrast is really hitting our primary read, right? The character's face. And we can then go in and adjust this, right? And say, well, look, maybe, maybe not quite so yellow, right? Maybe let's sort of push you know, some of the, let's make it a little bit more green, right? We, we can tweak it, you know, so that's what it was before, sort of just playing around. Yeah, yeah, just sort of tweaking. Now, if we turn it off, again, it's a subtle punch, right? It's like, oh, it's a little bit more saturated. Oh, it's a little bit more saturated. So again, those are the things that can really help. The last thing that I found really sort of helpful is to think about putting tonal sort of washes over the entire sort of image. And this really helps to kind of, you know, blend these things together a little bit more and make it feel a little bit less like, again, you can kind of really see here, um, there's this feeling of, you know, this down here being like a really sort of strong um, uh, sort of edge, you know. So I can literally just paint over those things and, and pull that contrast down a little bit as a separate layer. And then I can you know, erase that out, get maybe a few areas where we do have that contrast, but make sure that is selective. And yeah, just simple, normal layers, nothing, nothing fancy. And all we're doing, you can pull the, if, if you get, if you do get, if you do have a hard time creating the subtlety um, with your kind of like tablet tool or whatever, you can always really, really, you know, make that easy by pulling the opacity down, right? Just make the literal opacity that your um, brush is at really low. And again, we can push and pull, right? I can pull that back, right? We can play around with that. Okay, make this a little bit bigger. Again, I'm often just looking at it quite small on screen because that helps me sort of read the overall composition better. So we can see there, that's sort of what's happening. Now I can do the same thing as I'm often playing around with, with these sort of textures, right? So we can add a little bit more texture vibrancy. Um, again, putting some of these sort of warmer colors that we've got, we can put some of these, you know, over other parts of the image, get a little bit of color vibrancy going, which again, just lifts the overall sort of feel of the image a bit, makes it feel a little bit more sophisticated and again, we can sort of pull some of those 
down there. And the way I always view this is like, you know, put, put some of it on, then sort of pull it back. Um, you know, that's often the way we're going to get the, you know, that sort of most, um, you know, effective balance. So again, you know, you can see this image is, you know, a little bit more, we have some lost edges, some found edges. It's working pretty well in terms of, uh, you know, focal read, but we can push that, you know, nicely. One of the things I often do is just do levels and then do an order levels and kind of see what that does. This looks like it's going to, um, yeah, push it down a little bit more. But yeah, let's see if we can crunch this, right? Bring up the, the highlights. And what I'm going to do is maybe just sort of put pull that to the, oh, let's see. What we can do is let's duplicate these, duplicate these levels. Is that working? Right, let's make one of them at luminosity, one of them at saturation and let's just pull the saturation down a little bit so again take, turn those off you can see it's just giving us a little bit more sort of crunch and again that that is really sort of pushing those darks quite a bit um, other things we can do let's make a new hard light layer make this let's change that to brush get our airbrush go D or default it's going to give us a black and again we can just sort of put our vignette on there right really kind of focus the right focus the eye on this kind of diagonal so again um, you know this is one of those things where at this stage it's a really good idea to sort of step back and say hey you know um, let's you know take a little break maybe um, come back and sort of just check that contrast. You can also save out a version, look at it on your phone, look at it, you know, on um, uh, your iPad, your tablet, different screen, and just sort of get a feel for like, you know, is this having too much contrast, right? Does this look good? Does this look bad? We'll try a few other things that I think often, uh, you know, really worth trying, which is, you know, we're just gonna experiment with the overall color grade a little bit and see if we can sort of homogenize these colors slightly which I think could be really useful again that's the blacks let's pull the let's make the blacks a little bit more sort of blue again we can make them a little bit darker still and so what I notice is again I've got sort of two monitors here and the colors are looking slightly different depending on which which one this is. So that's where, again, as soon as I see that, I, I get a little bit suspicious and I'm more likely to kind of want to say, hey, you know, um, let's, uh, let's go and, um, you know, check out what this looks like elsewhere. Um, again, I feel, like, I feel like this grade is looking a little bit better. All right. And again, we've got a very monotone um, light and dark sort of you know rendering thing here not not heaps of you know flat color and simple stuff that's kind of fine there's a lot of other experimental things you can do you know we can play with sort of you know adding some some sort of overall gradients there's a lot of these kind of tricks that i find uh you know a quite sort of good to play around with especially if you know you feel like yeah stuff's not quite working it's not sort of dramatic enough right it's not sort of you know aggressive enough or you know whatever it is um, some of these things can can sort of really help to kind of add a little bit of drama right again especially if we sort of look at it from that thumbnail phase and yeah just kind of looking looking for something that is dramatic we can also use the selections here to kind of help us do that so if I select that background I can then erase out some of that sort of redness from the background and again, just pushing that idea, right? That this is kind of red and right. That's sort of where we where we want to look. So again, it's it's not very subtle, right? But again, um, you know, often these things work because you know they're they're not subtle, right? They work because they're you know sort of basic simple plans: warm versus cool, light versus dark. Let's sort of you know push the push the focus where we you know, where we want it and, you know, that'll kind of help. So anyway, that's probably it 
for the moment for the majority of the image i think it works pretty well as as is but with your images um, again, always remember that you can come back to it. None of these things need to be final. None of these things need to be, you know, the, the absolute sort of finished um, product. You know, you can sort of still keep tweaking it every now and then. And, you know, that's going to be fine, right? You know, that's going to be, that's going to work absolutely um, no problems. You can come back to it. You can tweak it. And, you know, like even though I'm, I'm, I often, you know, come back to these things, I feel like this one's working okay. I feel like it's doing what we needed it to do. Uh, I feel like it's got a little bit of drama. So, yeah, I think I'm going to call this one done because it's nice and contrasty. I think it kind of works. And, uh, again, a good little sort of one to two hour sketch image. You can post it on Instagram you know, sort of push your, um, you know, skills just one image at a time like this. And again, you can use these same techniques to create very, very highly polished finished illustrations if you want as well. So let me know if this has been sort of fun or helpful. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions on technical sort of side of this or anything else I can add, extra tutorials I can do to kind of help um, but yeah, this is essentially the same sort of process that I'd use for everything. You can use it for concept art, just playing around like this images for yourself. You can use it for high end kind of illustration. It's just a matter of putting in more time. The more composition, the more the composition needs to be sort of highly polished, the more you need to do roughs, um, grayscale roughs, figure out your color scheme, really kind of finesse all the planning. But again, what I've done in this one, which is kind of just like making it up and responding to what's there, playing around, I think is also a really good skill that is worth you building over time. But anyway, that's all I've got for this one. Check out the quick start guide and we'll catch you around. Happy drawing.